Nation all around the world. Once again, you are listening to the VMware Communities Roundtable Podcast. This is podcast number 466. My name is Eric Nelson, and today is Wednesday, February 12th. And with me today, as always, my co-host, John. John White, how are you doing today? Doing well, Eric. It's the 20th, though. <laughs> it is the 20th. <laughs> yeah. Uh, rats. I was hoping it would be the, the didn't I say 20th? You what said twelfth, but um, the twelfth. It is the twentieth. At VMware, go. we've now in- introduced a time travel as yeah, a service. That's right. I just go back and TTS forth whatever I want. Is right. what we call it. Right. Uh, color yeah. the Bay Report today. Drove across the um, the San Mateo Hayward Bridge. Uh, it was windy and choppy, but sunny somehow, and so that means green water and brown water at the same time. Nice. I, I don't know how that works. Nice. nice. I, it has been raining a lot here in the Bay Area. In fact. Nine out of the 12 major reservoirs in uh, California are overflowing or full. Oh, wow. So, so we are all watered up. And, yeah. Uh, and we're supposed to get more water. So yay for us. It's, yep. it's going to be muddy for till like June. Two seasons. It's fire yep. and flood. Right? Yep. That's how it's going. On the show today, we have uh, Eve uh, Sanford. Eve's in the studio with us. Eve, thanks for being here. Hey, everybody out on uh, Facebook, Facebook and YouTube, thanks for uh, joining us and, and saying hello and watching us. Uh, Eve is going is going to be talking about cloud providers, do's and don'ts, with, and uh, and he is actually uh, what are you? What is your title, Eve? Uh, so I'm actually CEO of the Com Division Group. We are a small consulting firm working primarily um, in the cloud space, both um, e- uh, both on the service provider side as well as on the customer customer side and we also have an EUC team and uh, we also help the cloud BU, uh, cloud provider BU uh, for within VMware um, from a go-to-market perspective and so that's my role. I'm VCDX on cloud so I had the wonderful experience of defending both uh, cloud director and vRealize automation in one session which was uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's in, always kind in, of a in, yin and yang. In, yeah. Interesting one but right. um, yeah. All right, all right, great. Well, it's amazing to have you in the in the, in the studio. I know you came all the way over from Germany, right? So thanks for being out here in uh, Silicon Valley. And we also want to say thanks for the uh, box of chocolates from the V Experts. We've got it right here. Uh, it, it it came. I think I tweeted out thanks a lot to all you guys. Uh, this is an awesome thing. It's a it's a complete box full of European chocolates in here. We give it to anybody that comes in, and uh, and so thanks to Com Division and for you guys for putting that together and uh, printing them out, signing them, and a nice card so appreciate you doing that yeah it's a, it's been a tradition we do that i think for the last five years we we always every year pick out i think in total we only give out 100 of these boxes and we send them all over the globe and um so um yeah that has become a quite a nice interesting interesting story to see them where they show up all, all, all over the globe. <laughs> right so cloud providers do's and don'ts but before we do that and then we also have tommy berry on in the in the studio tommy how's it going Good, good, good. I think good. it's been uh, about a year since I've been yeah, on the show. Yeah. So Tommy nice is a team it. team lead for our social media outbound program. Oh, yeah. So you run a couple of resources uh, and uh, all the outbound social your, that we see on VMware.com That's somehow right. directly or indirectly goes through you, through your team, right? That's right. The not so mystery man uh, behind uh, VMware on Twitter. So we're going to talk a little social here at the end of the podcast yeah. episode. It's yeah, yeah. Fun. Very, very exciting. Just to give you kind of a, uh, a early bit, uh, we are doing more evangelistic type work on the social channels that's so right. we could talk a little bit about that i saw some really great tweets on home, home lab stuff that's yeah right. the home lab stuff was Keep really pretty cool last uh, last last week or two on social that's good uh and you got some twitter feedback from the twitter account reps that came in right so we yep. can talk a little bit about that at the end of the show as well so that's going to be fun if you're into social media or trying to get in, in expanded reach tommy's the guy to right. to get to know right uh, along with everybody else in the ecosystem so before we do that john uh, and and I know Corey's on the phone, so Corey, we'll hit you first. Uh, I know the V Expert app is up, and uh, you guys are voting, and people are voting. The V Expert pros are voting. Uh, so, how's it going? When do we expect some uh, 2019 results? Yeah, hey, Eric, hey everybody. So, yeah, so uh, actually, it was really cool. We did a uh, V Expert Pro meeting this morning. We went over uh, the review process, the voting process. So VX for pros are voting as of this morning, which is fantastic. Um, so we went through that with Val. Uh, we expect to have this wrapped up uh, and results for the awards pushed out um, in the first week of March. Um, first so that, week of March. Exciting. Can't wait for that. Yes. 
Nice. It seems like that always drifts out, you know, as uh, as a, as my, as your manager. I just kind of note that every time I ask you, it's like, yeah, second week in February. No, wait, wait, third week in February. Now it's always it's always been March first. It's it has always changed. been. Yeah, it has not changed. The funny thing is when uh, when you were out last year and I took it over and I ran it, we we got it done in like June. So I got <laughs> <laughs> so well, I, I, we I, had other delays as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm not gonna. <laughs> Call kettle block or anything because that's not going to happen because I was bad. All right. Well, thanks for that update. We're, we're all bated breath, and uh, hopefully you guys got your app under control um, uh, from last week, so that should be good. All the voting going on with the VExpert Pros, very excited about that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and I know the subgroups have been busy as well. I know there was uh, some uh, NSX briefing, and I think Ken for the, the VSAN subgroup was also going to do uh, a briefing mm-hmm. or call reach out. Yep, so, we had that yesterday. Yep, so those guys are going. We had a call yesterday morning and yesterday evening. It was fantastic. Great, great, great. All right, well, thanks a lot. So I'll flip over to John, who's uh, busy on his phone, to see if we got any news, or you're just out being phone guy, right? No, no, I, I'm being phone guy. I have no news. No news. I, I didn't no even news. look up uh, the, the VMUG meetings, yeah. um, which I promised to do. Right. I well, I know that the VMUG leadership is in town. They're doing yep. uh, the VMUG leadership, and mm-hmm. I think we're going to go. Uh, Julia, what, when are we going to meet them? We're going to go hang out with them tomorrow. Is that what? Thursday? Thursday yeah. yeah, yeah. So we're going to go hang out with the Vima guys and chat with them, maybe get to go go to dinner with a few of those. So that's always fun when uh, when they're around, right? Um, they do their, their annual conference, leadership conference. So that's good. Uh, all right. Well, I don't have any other news either. Um, so we'll just jump into uh, our guest. So Eve, uh, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, how long have you been in the tech industry, what do you do for a living? So, um, yeah, I've been in the tech industry. I think I started um, my first job in the tech industry was 16, so uh, quite a bit of time. Um, started the first company with around 18, 19. Um, so uh, been, in, been in business since since 96, so we, we celebrated, I think, 20 years anniversary three years ago in Vegas. So um, that was quite a lot of fun. And um, I have been starting when web was actually in the early days and started off um, with more or less software as a service wasn't defined back then. So the first product <laughs> we developed was more or less a software as a service. We started telling people you are renting software and they were like, why don't we buy that and host that ourselves? And um, that was pretty successful. And uh, But I figured out at one point I don't want to be in the hosting business myself. So, so got rid of that part. And since over 10 years now, uh, my group or my company is now really focused around helping not only service providers, but enterprises and partners on, on how to go to market with, with VMware technology. So we are, we are not really a, a classic partner like what everybody else does in talking to enterprise customers. We are more somewhere in between VMware and the partners and helping everybody out. And um, f- especially for me, the last five years were more around service providers. So I was in the wonderful position to tell everybody or being involved in, in telling everybody that VRA is replacing VCD. And now I'm back in the position to tell everybody VCD is back, so, <laughs> which is two different markets, really. But it's, a different, it's an interesting position to be in. Nice, nice. Yeah, well, I can't can't wait to get down down that dialogue and uh, explore the the dichom- dichotomy and how that how we got where we're at. But uh, before we do that, maybe you can just give us kind of your perspective of uh, cl- cloud providers, because yeah, as you say, you kind of you know work in that you know engaging with cloud providers. So why don't you tell us a, an update? I know you know we had vCloud Air, we had the 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 are the, the our cloud provider program. Where are we at, and what's your impressions of everything? I think in general where we are at is is from a cloud provider perspective. I think a few years ago everybody was saying it's like, yeah, not everybody is going to move into the cloud. Then everybody said everything is going to move into the cloud. And I think we are now getting into a more realistic market situation where everybody figures out, okay, there is some stuff which goes into the cloud. I mean, no one is discussing anymore that a lot of email and groupware stuff goes to Office 365. That has become more or less the norm. Um, 
we have tons of other applications. Everybody is using file sharing services and everything in the cloud, so that's that's a settled scenario. Companies are also getting now to the point, especially what I see in Europe, where they are typically pretty hold back from, yeah, we want to own everything, everything is in our data center, we want to control everything. People are more and more getting open and moving some of their workloads into the cloud. However, we have an interesting market because not everybody wants to go to one of the big players like um, like Amazon, whether it's Amazon native or with VMware or Google or Microsoft or anybody else. It's We have a lot of choices out there. I mean, VMware, when we look at the ecosystem, VMware has, I think, roughly around 4,000 service providers in the cloud provider program, uh, which goes from people with just a bunch of VMs up to really the large guys like, like Rackspace, OVH, and those people. And they all have different offerings. And we wouldn't have, I think, 4,000 service providers betting on the VMware ship if the VMware story wouldn't make any sense from, uh, from a cloud perspective. So. <laughs> I think it's an interesting time to be in, and we, we also see more and more of the normal partners move into more like managed services scenarios because customers don't want to maintain their infrastructure anymore. Companies get to the point that they understand they are not in the business of operating IT, especially um, companies which many people haven't had on the look for, for cloud, like SMBs, are actually moving more and more towards cloud because it doesn't make sense to run all the stuff yourself. And so that's why it's interesting to see that there is more and more motion. But there is also quite a lot of difference between what customers see and what service providers see. I did a few panel discussions where um, when you look at the advertising, a service provider typically tells you, or a cloud provider, oh, we have data centers in multiple continents and everything, multiple terabits whatsoever, connection in between them. And then you listen to that and then you go on to the customer side and try to understand, or from a customer perspective, what they understand out of it. From a customer perspective, that means very often it's like, oh, this means I don't have to worry about availability, disaster recovery, and all that kind of stuff anymore. And then we see these things happen, like Microsoft a couple of weeks ago losing a few thousand mailboxes, um, Amazon having a data center down situation. These are common scenarios. It's not that they are building on other technologies. It's they have data center outages the same way as enterprises have that, as governments have that, as everybody has these types of things. But the interesting part is that a lot of customers think by moving everything into the yeah. cloud, all mm -hmm. of these problems are gone. And they are not gone. You still need to solve these problems. And um, it's interesting to see how um, also cloud providers um, react to that because it's it's not that easy with many cloud providers to just say, oh, I want to have my own backup solutions in there, or I want to have disaster recovery to a different cloud provider because just in case if you switch, if you are going offline, I want to have someone else. It's a very distinct business where people try to m move everything into it. And that's the, the other part. When you look at cloud, when you look at service contracts, it's everything is always built towards, it's easy to get into it, but getting out or moving in between yeah. clouds right. is, is, in, is, is, is a very complex story. And then at the same time, when you move in, you're at risk for whatever that cloud provider has managed not to do well. Right, where, <laughs> where you have to assess where they're at and then try to figure out, does your app fit to that cloud provider? And what happens if I do want to have a, you know, a solution to back them up, right? You know, like where, and what services do I play? So it's an interesting thing where you know, having a rack full of apps that I manage and run just in my own private space, uh, I have to worry about that. And it's surprising how many times I hit like, oh wait, no one's dealing with this because no one's thought about it and I have to deal with it as an app owner. Right. Yeah, and, and the other interesting part is that you see more and more the whole cloud business changing a bit. It's it's many, especially of the very large cloud providers, are talking more to sea levels, which is which is fine. But that ends up in scenario of complete miscommunication. One of the things which I just had in, in Germany with a customer where um, the customer was talking to one of the one of the mega clouds and they were telling them it's like oh yeah you can just move your VMware workloads in here and I told them it's like look what they are talking about is a migration process you, we are talking about thousands of VMs and they are this is just not going to happen in, in two or three weeks time and he said what do you mean with migration and I said it's like look they are running not on VMware they are running a completely different platform 
And they went, it's like, but we don't want to actually get off VMware in the first place. And I said, yeah, then you should actually look for a cloud provider which runs on VMware and not just <laughs> right. actually look for the price tag or who actually gives you the best incentive to, to, to go down this path. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting. You, you said so many things there. I want to start to unpack it a little bit. Yeah. One of the things you pointed out was that we're becoming more and more comfortable with actually running, you know, with SaaS, you know, software as a service. And a lot of companies are realizing there's things that are very important to our business, but are not core to our business. For example, you, you, you mentioned email, right? So nobody says like one of my like key differentiating factors of my business is how well we run exchange, right? That's, you know, it's important that it's up and running, but you know, if we do it better than anybody else, it doesn't actually add to our bottom line. Right, so that's a, a great target to outsource to somebody who's providing it as a service. Um, but then you start looking at some of like more important apps. When I was in IT operations, you know, we looked at like our ERP solution um, as kind of our, our key, like it was the, the crown jewels of, of all our intellectual property and everything that we were doing. But then over time we said our expertise at operating it and having it installed, having it upgraded, maintaining the hardware underneath it maybe that's not actually important to the company. And if we could find somebody that would host that for us, you know, um, maybe it's the manufacturer, maybe it's a specific, you know, cloud provider specialist that knows ER either that specific ERP solution or ERP in general and interactions with databases, like that is a great, another, you know, prime target now, it, you know, that things are a little bit more mature to outsource to a cloud provider. Is that am I on, on oh, yeah. base there? That's 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 a perfect example. But that also shows you are talking about outsourcing. And when we look at IT over the last twenty years, we are seeing that we are moving to a certain degree in circles, because on one hand we had um, initially when we when we look at the start of IT becoming more common in companies, everything was yeah it was or a lot of the things were centrally hosted. You had dial-up lines, you had a terminal or whatever else to access um, kind of a mainframe or large-scale computer. Computer. Then client server came, you moved everything uh, back in house. Then the first outsourcing wave more or less came and everybody was trying to push everything out of the company or at least get other companies to do the service. To a certain degree, figuring out that that didn't work, moving it back in and now we are with cloud to a certain degree back into a position that it's different. It's, I mean, the technology behind the scenes has changed, but we can see that IT somehow moves in circles and, <laughs> and it, it goes forth and back. And I think we still don't know what exactly is the point, but I think the difference what we are looking at from a cloud perspective is we see far more specialized solutions. So when we don't attempt from an, from an enterprise perspective, if we don't attempt to do everything with one cloud provider, we can find people who are highly specialized, like what you said. Someone is very good in hosting exchange and potentially archiving systems and automation systems and whatever is behind that. Someone else might be very good in hosting my ERP solution. And very often, interesting enough, that's not necessarily the ERP vendor themselves, because if you see how they operate their cloud, sometimes it's more scary than anything else. Um, and so we have all these different opportunities, and that also makes clear that also VMware's idea of this is going to be a multi-cloud environment, this is not going to be one solution. And also one of the things I think which is important in this is we look at it, it's it's not everything is cloud native apps because it's when we look at the industry at the moment everybody talks about everything goes container goes cloud native yeah try to throw your 15 years old erp solution into a container that's going to be a lot of fun um, <laughs> and there are these things out there i mean when we look at vmware compatibility list every time vmware throws an old microsoft operating system out at the bottom uh, people start to complain about it and you look at it it's like this is over 15 years old operating systems. You should really not run that anymore. Right. And that's the other part with the cloud is, is, is it's how is this all going to affect all of that? So, and that is, I think, why we also see from a VMware perspective that there are so many cloud providers out there besides the mega clouds. And there are even uh, investment companies actually behind a lot of them because mm -hmm. they all see that beside the mega clouds, there will be specialized clouds for applications, for verticals, Geographical, I think that's in the long run not going to survive. I mean, when we when we talk to cloud providers, um, very often currently the, the their unique selling point is yeah because we are local, we we comply with local law. Uh, 
I mean, Microsoft, Amazon, everybody has figured that one out on how to comply with local law and, and setting up local data centers. This is not going to be your unique selling point. You cannot actually build a business on the fact it's like, I'm local. On the other side, this also makes a difference for these service providers because when you look at a large one, let's say Microsoft loses 10,000 exchange mailboxes, that's not ideal, and um, but in reality, it's not going to do really any big harm to their reputation. When you are a small service provider and you are in a specific industry or a specific region, imagine that you just tell customers, it's like, oh, we just lost the ERP data of your ERP systems of the last two weeks. Um, that's potentially going to stop that service provider from operating, and that makes it also clear that even though the smaller ones or specialized ones in many cases have much higher, um, much higher infrastructure costs behind them because they need to operate on a different level. They cannot afford the fact that they are losing data or anything else. Hmm. Right. They they recognize the specialized needs of their customers, and maybe their pricing and and setting things up specifically with those needs in mind, like maybe building it into the infrastructure from the beginning rather than having a general infrastructure and then reacting to a bunch of different customer use cases. In, 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 I'm just wondering, do you see any of the cloud providers actually kind of layering on top of mega cloud providers where you could you know, build an isolated service you know, that, that runs on Microsoft or AWS where you're running a, a, a SaaS service and then selling it to a, a secondary party? I mean, that's, that's the other interesting part when I talk to, let's say, medium, especially also medium-sized service provider. I mean, VMware, in, in reality, um, that's VMware, what VMware is doing, right? Is, right? Is, yeah. is nothing sure. else. Um, but even when we talk to, um, to medium-sized service providers uh, somewhere out there, it's interesting how many of them actually, it's getting a more and more collaborative uh, work. So you have more and more of them where they say, it's like, yeah, we want to outburst potentially to VMware on AWS, or we want to actually host certain workloads on Azure because the customer is running their exchange over there anyway, or they are moving something to, towards Amazon because they have the better web application integration whatsoever. So you see that more and more of them are actually in the position to actually to really interact with each other. And this is also something where you see that VMware also from a service provider perspective is starting to build services around that with, with tools like Cloud Provider Hub, which is specifically for for service providers where they can actually pick and choose services and link them to each other. It's still all in, in early stages, but the first attempts to do that are there. And you and there are people who are very highly specialized. There are companies who can run data centers, and only because you can run a data center doesn't mean you should be a cloud provider. There are companies who run fiber optics lines. And, and I think we are seeing more and more in the industry is that companies, um, cloud providers, integrators, and everybody else are more and more specializing themselves on something which they are really good in. And I think that's very good from a customer perspective, but it also makes it difficult for customers because you can't, you don't have a one-stop shop you can go to anymore. Right. Are we are we seeing you know the the value prop here? I assume is reliability, affordability, better better value prop on cost. Um, are you seeing that play out? If you if you were to look at the, the the price of you know operating you know your IT resources now because of this uh, this movement to cloud and a hybrid cloud environment, do you see? customers starting to realize those cost savings or reliability? Or is it still too early in the game to say which one's actually financially better? I think the problem for most customers and most enterprises is they are not honest to themselves about their IT costs. So um, mm -hmm. the, the, the challenge over there is, and that's, this, is, this is different when we talk about really the, the enterprise customers, something like Global Fortune 5000 or something like that. They know very well about their IT costs. But when we go below that, when we go into the, the medium-sized enterprises or even small businesses, very often they have no clue what their IT really costs. And this is where, where, where reactions come from when you see VMware on AWS where someone says it's like, oh, this is, this is ridiculously expensive. Expensive. And then you look at the numbers and you say, no, it's not, because if I'm basically buying the, si the similar hardware, operate the hardware, do all the stuff that VMware does for me as a customer in the back end, 
and I'm re I'm I'm adding up all these sums, then in the end it's 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 not a bargain, but it's it's actually it's not ex more expensive, and I think that's that's the point, and it's far more realistically run because those people who run on the cost comparison they typically don't have uh, data centers with multiple availability zones, um, environments like VMware on AWS where if you lose a physical node a few minutes later you have a new node. That's that's not how a real data center in IT works because the times where companies would have spare servers, um, let alone things like a test environment where you would really test upgrades before you do them, this is gone. And so based on that, I think the challenge is that the price comparisons are not realistic. Uh, yeah, no, people aren't looking at real estate costs, right? Um, I knew of a customer, and this is a little bit apocryphal, but they, they operated in a fairly expensive real estate market, but they had a 99-year lease dating back from you know 30 or 40 years. So they looked at their real estate cost of their data center um, as fairly cheap, not thinking, oh, we could be doing something else, you know, more value add to the company than running a data center in this you know super expensive land. Even if that's just subleasing it out to somebody else who's willing to pay the market rate, right? And then you know risk reduction of availability never shows up on a balance sheet, you know, in in any way that's you know, easily justifiable or, or back, you know, able to be backed up with numbers. Like, oh, we're more available and that's worth $500,000 a year. Like, n nobody says that, right? But that's that's also the interesting part when I'm, when I'm advising service providers, very often you get from the management, it's like, we need to sell 99.99 whatsoever percent availability. And I said, it's like, look first at what Amazon, Rackspace and everybody else does. Basically, none of them in general gives you for infrastructure services such high availability because it's unrealistic to do that at that cost. So you need to actually come up with additional services and solutions to act to come to a similar level. And it's it's always a matter on whether you want to cheat on it or not. And and if someone tells me he has 99.99% availability, and then at the same point in time I look how they operate their infrastructure, it's, it's impossible to actually get these numbers together. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, is what's the reason behind that? And I, I, the worst case scenario I once had, and that's a story which I always come back with customers, is you need to also validate that the service provider really does what they are telling you. Because I had one case um, in Europe where a service provider actually for a customer, they had to build a very complex infrastructure. So customer had an audit, based on that audit, they uh, requested a new quote for a very complex availability setup. And then finally, the customer agreed to pay the extra amount. But guess what's happening? The controller of the customer of the service provider actually got this whole th thing in his hands and actually did a risk analysis together with an insurance company and figured out that instead of actually building all of this, it would actually be cheaper to to uh, to just go for an insurance for that and just say it's like, poohoo! If the customer actually fails with it, uh, they can sue us. We pay them the money and everything right. is good. And the chances are. Uh, higher to win in the lottery. But this is a risk on the other side for the customer because in that case, that customer was a hospital organization. So um, ethical, it's a different discussion. But this is also something where um, what I always tell customers is like, don't be blindfolded by any nice looking marketing campaigns and anything else. It's like, if you're betting everything on one service provider, it's, it's actually uh, potentially even a requirement to go to them and say it's like I want to visit the data center and um, in reality if you are not talking to the mega clouds that's possible with most service providers it still doesn't mean that you understand all the stuff which is going on there or that your stuff really ends up in that server which you see there but it at least gives you a bit of a feeling on how, how they operate uh, and and how their infrastructure looks like and also it's start, you start to think about like what that SLA actually says Right, indemnification is it just like, oh, I get a refund on that portion of my bill, but you know, as you point out, healthcare providers or hospital providers actually have, you know, back end risk for that service going down that could reach you know millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars potentially. So you know, who who's sharing in that risk, right? And if, is the service provider sharing that risk in that SLA? Probably not. No, if you if you look at most terms and conditions of service providers, in reality, all you get is oh, for the time of the outage, you don't have to pay your rent, um, which yeah. is which yeah. is, yeah. and those are the other things. I mean, it's to be realistic for most 
enterprise customers, this is still far better than what they currently have in their IT environment because if they currently have an outage, they also have nothing. And what most service providers provide from an infrastructure is far more sophisticated than what most enterprises would run internally by themselves all the time. It's only we need to get uh, especially these SLA numbers into a more realistic scenario. It's it's. It's something which I see day in and day out from an, from an, from an architect's perspective again and again is, is customers are sometimes very unrealistic about their availability figures. And on, on one hand, you have that um, being, being unrealistic. On the other hand, it's you don't have the funds for it. Um, someone tells you it's like my SAP can't be down more than 15 minutes, but I'm not willing to spend extra money for it. Which is like, okay, if your SAP is down for 15 minutes, you have 10,000 employees, let's just actually do the quick math on what it costs you if 10,000 employees are not working for four hours. So why is it a problem to spend another 50, 100K or what's, whatever else on that infrastructure to run that? And this is a di this is a completely different discussion, but that's interesting when people move into the cloud, all of a the sudden they expect complete availability, nearly 100% availability, um, automatic backup, automatic failover and all of that. And this is not what most service providers provide. They provide infrastructure as a service or you're running a SaaS application, then it's a different story. But even then, when you look at Microsoft, SharePoint, Office 365, default service doesn't include any backups. Most customers are completely unaware of that, that right. if Microsoft loses your mailbox, it's gone. Right. That's it. Yep. You can buy additional backup services, but it's something you need to do still for yourself. Yeah, it's a it's it's exactly what I've experienced. I've experienced all of these in looking at cloud operations. We run a lot of our community stuff on AWS, and we get right into that right where I'm running applications. I'm running the vExpert app. I'm running CloudCred. I'm running a couple other things on AWS, and yeah, you have to start to deal with this right. And you're right; they just give you uh, you don't have to pay for that hour right, right. and you're like. Oh. We didn't even realize this when we were building the app. Everybody just assumes AWS it's going to be there, mm -hmm. it's going to be on, and that we don't have any issues. Now you do trade it off. We're you know like okay, so what? Uh, the V Expert app's gone for a day. Well, all right, that's 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 we almost self insure right where we just we self insure by just uh, making it harder for our customer base to do something with us, right? right? But that's kind of like a it's only a one percent chance of that going down. So that means X number of years it's going to go down, and therefore. The customer is going to have to deal with that during because we're right. not running a hospital. So we 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 judge that because it comes down to a budget, right? Yeah. And how much do we want to spend there? Um, it, we can we can wrap up on the cloud kind of provider update yeah. scenario. I want to get to vCloud Director and hear what's happening with that as well. Does anybody else have any follow up questions before we move on to vCloud Director? I think we could spend ages on this. Anyway. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah. Let's let's take a quick look at vCloud Director. I just got a tweet this morning with someone else who said it's like, oh, sadly, we need to move off vCloud Director. That was an enterprise customer because they finally need to move away from 5.5, which is end of support, end of life, and end of everything uh, mm -hmm. already for nearly a year. Uh, but we still see, see even enterprise customers running vCloud Director. And many people, when you look at the UI and everything over the last few years, said it's like, this is dead. There is no development or nothing going on. When you, on the other side, look at what's happening over the last two years with vCloud Director is like, even though the steps might not be as fast as people want to have them, it's moving everything from an existing platform, including APIs to HTML5 and everything else is an interesting move. The, the front end side for customers is completely new, which is also bringing up a lot of challenges because people are used to the old interface, which has been working that way for nearly five, six, seven years. And now everything has changed, and it has changed in many ways the way customers have asked for vCloud Director to change. Like, we don't want to have vCloud Director always had this concept of a vApp being the main primary container. That's gone. Now, people actually get confused when they go in there. It's like, where is my vApp gone? Why do I see a VM directly? How is all of that working? So the 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 vCloud director team really took the time to to step back and say it's like let's look at all the feedback we have and actually rebuild this from the UI from the ground up because vCloud director I remember when I was running in vCloud director 1.0 the UI was more or less yeah it was never called out ex uh, externally like that but it was more or less a showcase on how a UI for a cloud provider could look like 
And all of a sudden, everybody was picking up that UI and actually taking it. I, I remember back then we had, I think in the US, were I think five or 10 service providers who really built their complete own user interface on top of vCloud Director. And vCloud Director is an API framework in the backend. And so what, what people didn't get over the last few years is that there was a lot of work going on in the back end in building up the APIs, all the all the learning out of vCloud Air, for example, VMware running their own cloud offering was a good learning experience for VMware on how to rebuild vCloud or parts of vCloud Director to make it more realistic to the market. And now that we see the front end over the last two years um, with um, every, every new version, 9.0, 9.5, um, um, and 9.1, I think, somewhere in between, um, all of these versions gives, uh, give us little bits and pieces of that a new feeling. And the next release, uh, whenever that comes, is most likely going to show a complete user interface on HTML5. So everything we know from vSphere is going to be there as well. We also see that a lot of things look similar like what we have in the vSphere field, because that was another big problem for end customers using vCloud Director. You had a completely different UI. Everybody was saying it's like this is vSphere in the back end, but it's completely different. It looks different, it behaves different, I cannot use my features. And this is something which we already see for at least features like NSX, is, is the NSX UI in vCloud Director is almost looking identical than what you have locally for NSX. Um, and we also see other features which make it easier in the past, for service providers, it often meant when you were onboarding customers, you were shipping hard disks around and doing all kinds of complex uh, lifting and shifting. And now we have functions which allow us to move workloads from on-premises into the cloud. And we don't need dedicated fiber for that anymore. And a lot of the visions, which we also have seen in, in VMworld keynotes over the last few years, now become more and more of a reality. You can move things around. At the moment, we are still in the phase where things are moving into the cloud, but I think in the future we will also see more movements between uh, clouds. And and also within vCloud Director from an architectural perspective is um, you can see that there is a shift in mind on how service providers are operating cloud as well. Is is one of the products which came out in Vegas during VMworld was Cloud Provider Pod, for example, which is a frame, really more a development framework for service providers to automate complete bare metal deployment of the complete stack because service providers were complaining it's too complex. It's vSphere, it's NSX, it's vZen, it's, it's uh, vROPS. Um, it, it's all these individual products and you need to be aware which version works which with, with which com in which combination, how to get all of this set up. And so there is now toolkits available which make that easier for service providers. You can basically just chuck in um, physical hardware and it will pixie boot ESXi hosts, deploy everything on it. And so there is also a change for service providers where VMware also focuses on the fact that it should be easier. Service providers shouldn't worry about building that vSphere infrastructure. It should be all there. And, and this is something which also shows not only for from a vCloud Director perspective where this is heading. And also, then when we go back to vCloud Director, we see in the past, you only had the choice, you use the UI from VMware, or if you want to change something, you had to build everything yourself. And, um, from scratch, the entire from scratch, thing. Yeah. The entire thing. And this has changed as well. We have features like where you can build VRO workflows and and um, attach them into, into um, VCD, like what we have in VRA, where you can build more or less X as a service, which will become very interesting for service providers as well to build something over there. And this also can be very interesting for people out there because this means we have now the second tool from a VMware perspective, which puts VRO far more into focus. So on one hand, VR, everybody who does automation on the VRA side needs to learn more or less VRO. VCD is now in the same position. So that also gives a, gives a lot of uplift for VRO, which is the, the more or less, uh, in many cases, unloved child of right. VMware for the last uh, 10, 15 years. Um, but it becomes more and more important for people to learn that as an automation uh, technology. And that's that's also something which I always uh, uh, give as advice when, when people approach me during conferences or stuff like that, which technology should I learn or uh, especially what should I focus on? There is Python, there is all this cloud native stuff. And that's all great. 
But the point is, what's your focus? If you are, let's say, if I were starting with 1820 or something else, I would definitely go into the cloud native or, or something like that direction. But those people with experience, I think in the next few years will have a much better choice if they go into tools like VRO, because we have this both in the enterprise as well as in the service provider space. And the point with VRO is not so much about that you learn the coding piece, but you need to understand the infrastructure and business processes and everything behind that. And if you get that done, and that means experience. This is nothing which you learn directly out of college. Whenever I see people, um, you can tell everybody how to code something, but if you don't think about all the other bits and pieces in the infrastructure as a service provider, I cannot just say, oh, I'm switching a VLAN there because you need to think about what else is going on in my infrastructure from that perspective. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play my uh, decoder ring rule, one of my rules here. Uh, I think you decoded uh, VCD, V Cloud Director, uh, VRA, V Realize Automation, mm -hmm. and VRO, which is V Realize Orchestrator. And as you pointed out, the uh, the, the best kept se uh, free secret that you get with uh, vSphere, right? Um, everybody uh, everybody has it, and nobody. It seems like 80% uh, of the market doesn't know they have it. They don't know that they have it, and most people think it's a very complex way um, of how how to do things. Power CLI is clearly much easier and much quicker to adopt. But in the long run, especially when it comes to enterprise automations or, or service provider field, etc., Power CLI is nice, but VRO is a far more scalable solution then. And, and it's integrated into the products. And I think that's the interesting part we have now is we can now see from a VMware perspective more and more that all of these products actually follow same procedures. We get similar UIs everywhere. We get the same backend technologies in the backend. And um, this is more or less what when VCD was de declared dead, and it was never really declared dead in the first place, the statement was, it's going to be only for service providers. Mm -hmm. um, but back then, the statement has always been is like, we have VRA on the enterprise side, VCD on the, on the service provider side, but the backend technology is going to be the same. And if we look at it now, five years later, um, it's still the same. We have NSX on both sides. We have um, we have different front end tools, different mm -hmm. cloud management platforms. One is for the enterprise space. One is for uh, service providers. But everything else behind that is exactly the same. It doesn't make a difference whether you run an enterprise or a service provider. You are going to not get around running NSX. If you want to automate things, you are going to use tools like Orchestrator. Um, and that's an interesting point where all of the sudden, the, all of these technologies which drifted apart at one point now get back together again. Converging. And I also, it's it's interesting that, you know, VMware is publishing this like cloud builder toolkit, right, for service providers, which means that each of the individual products needs to have APIs integrated in order for that automation to occur. And, you know, VMware as a, you know, theoretically, you know, API first company, as we profess it, um, maybe you know, is our vision as opposed to, you know, 100% reality today. But, you know, those uh, APIs become more and more public, and then more and more people can use those, right? And, and that's an interesting step with the cloud provider pod as it currently is being done by the um, um, CPSBU, so by the cloud provider uh, business unit, because the cloud provider more or less gets the complete source code of that um, as well. So they, it's completely built in orchestrator. So, and that means for service providers, they can completely customize it to their needs as well, which is a different approach than what has been taken for many other products in the past. And whether this is going to be a better or worse so approach or, or what's going to be the surviving model or if that's going to change in a year because support figures out that if everybody messes around in the code, this is going to be a horrible scenario or it's going to be great because people are contributing back into it. It's not an open source project per se as you would normally operate it, but it's, it's a different approach. You get open packages, you can customize it, you can uh, use it in your own way. And that's an interesting approach, I think, to see how that is, especially for the service provider, if that's going to make any difference or not. It's fascinating. It's a vision of the future that's uh, pretty exciting. 
Right. All right. We have a couple more minutes before we shift to Tommy here. So the last couple things I have uh, on my list is if you had to pick like um, in your head, I know you've touched on what customers are experiencing, but if you had to showcase and you don't have to mention a customer name or any, any details, but uh, a customer that did uh, a hybrid cloud environment right, right? And then uh, the, and what were the characteristics that made them do a good job? And then uh, if you could pick one that somebody did it wrong and what were those characteristics? It's just so people get a sense of, uh, you know, how do you do a great job at this and how do you do a bad job? Uh, I think it comes down to the, uh, and we have seen exactly those scenarios in, in all degrees. Um, when you want to do a cloud migration successful, it's the same like you build a new IT infrastructure. You need to architect it from the ground up. So that mm -hmm. means when we look at it from a, um, and, and coming out of the VCDX field, when we look at it, well, you need to have your business requirements in the first place. You need to understand why am I doing that, for what business units, what are really my back-end requirements behind all of this before you make that switch. And it needs to be architected because it's in the end, in my experience, it's not going to be just one cloud. It's going to be multiple different potential cloud scenarios and there might be services which are still stuck in-house because you might have something as simple as your uh, building access system, which doesn't make sense to have that sit in the cloud somewhere because if your uplink goes down, you can't enter your building anymore. Um, so there might be good reasons to keep some stuff internal. And this is also what an architect needs to figure out is like, what is the dependency? I have uh, a friend of mine and that's more or less goes into the scenario of where it can go wrong. They, he works for a large furniture retailer and they did things in many cases wrong because management decided why would we need multiple uplinks. Okay, guess what? I was the second Saturday or something with in, in one of their stores and the complete cash system wasn't working anymore because the uplink was down. And guess what? On a Saturday, yes, you can have as many contracts. You know, I think everybody knows how easy it is to move, move, get a telco to move in and actually make changes to it. And you will get the finger pointing game where they say it's like, yeah, but it's somewhere in the uplink distance where we can't actually manage that. And that's done by someone else or or it's dicked somewhere and we can't find someone who actually can actually uh, get us to the cable or anything else. Um, so you need to really think about all the consequences and if this makes any changes to your business model. Mm. And um, yeah. the other thing is don't be too enthusiastic about timelines because moving something into the cloud is like moving something from one data center to another data center. No one normally plans to do that with uh, over a weekend. Over a weekend and with with four or six weeks notice, right. um, you need to architect things. And those companies who spend the time in architecting really a solution and and a clear cloud platform, I think those have a very good chance to be very successful in the cloud. And you also need to always have your clear decision guidelines on when am I going to stop a process which doesn't work, which is a bit like what I always say is the more or less SAP phenomenon where once you get across a certain point, people continue to invest in something, even though they know that they don't want to go down that route anymore. Because initially the thought was, it's like, oh yeah, we are just going to spend a few hundred K here and there, and then everything is going to be nice and shiny. And then two years later, the project is still going on and they spent multiple millions already. And no one has somewhere put in a decision. It's like, if we cross this boundary, we need to roll it back because it doesn't work. Mm. And I think that's an important step as well is if you figure out that cloud doesn't work for yourself, what would be the criteria to move everything back? And what would be required to get that step done? Because if you get yourself into signing up for license agreements with different vendors in, in actually migrating your licenses all into cloud licenses, that means in some cases you don't have licenses to do it on premises anymore. Right. And you can potentially not move it to another cloud because the licenses are not transferable to another cloud. And so these are the things where um, architects and to a certain degree as bad as it is, um, we never like that when legal and everything gets into our way. But when you move into the cloud to a certain degree, you need to take a very close legal look at, as, at, at it as well. Not only if you live in Europe where we have all our wonderful data privacy laws, it's uh, those data privacy laws affect you in many cases, even if you are not living in Europe, right. just by the fact right. that you might have one customer living in Europe. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. The idea that you have to um, cost and estimate f an architect for not just a cloud migration, but a failed cloud migration. You know, what if it all fails and we have to, you know, undo everything? 
It's a whole separate process. Right? I think it's something you need to be fair to yourself. Is is uh, IT projects can fail, mm -hmm. and um, and you need to have a plan B. As much as we all want that plan A works perfectly fine, but I think we all have learned over the last whatsoever years in IT that what's on the front page of the data sheet is not necessarily what you get in the back end. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. On paper is different than in reality, right? Yeah. That Saturday scenario absolutely has happened to me many times where they're just like, sorry, no network service. You're going to have to wait till Monday, right? I'm sorry I said this before, yeah. but there's a whole genre of jokes where the punchline is, oh, you must have seen the demo, right? It's <laughs> right. like, right. wait, how, yeah. I thought it, yeah. it could you know, fly me from here to here. Oh, you must have seen the demo. So, so good. Uh, well, well, uh, Eve, thanks a lot for coming and uh, giving us insight to, to your, your vision of the, the, pl the cloud market in general and the cloud providers. Uh, Com Division, great company. Thanks again for the chocolates and thanks for, <laughs> for coming by and uh, spending time. How do people follow you on Twitter? Uh, yeah, my Twitter handle is at Eve Sanford. And okay. I think you linked it in the podcast already, so yeah, I did. That's but, more, uh, more more likely easier than me trying to spell it. Yeah, correctly. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I believe it's uh, Y V E S S A N D F O R T. Yeah, right? there you That's go. At, at him. Uh, so g thanks for again for being on the show. We'll turn our our, our time to the left. I think we have maybe ten minutes left because we got a late start. Uh, to Tommy Barry. Tommy, thanks for hanging out with us and uh, being all geeky tech here, right? Because uh, this is this is where it's at, right? That's, that's that's going to be tough to follow. Yeah, uh, yeah, a little bit of a softer subject now with social. Yeah, but let's yeah, let's do yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, the reason I thought it would be interesting to have you on is that uh, you got to spend some time with some Twitter reps that came in mm -hmm. and talked to us a little bit. And uh, why don't you just give us a summary of what they told you? Because I thought it was interesting. Yeah, this was actually a great opportunity. Um, the comms team actually had a summit um, on site a few weeks ago, and one of the sessions they invited me um, into was just bringing in reps from LinkedIn, Twitter, and then some of the agencies to kind of talk about the changing social landscape and just what they're seeing, what are some of the trends, what are companies that are doing it right, what are companies that are doing it wrong. Um, and one of the interesting things that they said, which I think a lot of B2B companies kind of make the mistake of doing, is just talking about the product and selling the product just over and over and over again when a lot of our customers, a lot of our followers, they already know what our products are. They can do their own research. What more can we offer to them from a social program perspective You know that, that they're not getting, that they can't just go to you know, VMware.com and find? Um, and then one of the Twitter reps said this, and this was a, a great plug for our communities, was VMware is uniquely positioned in the market um, because of the vExperts and the community. They don't know how to explain, I don't think any of us do, why the experts are so active on Twitter, um, but we really need to build out our entire social program and our community programs around those V experts. And you know that's kind of been you know the baseline of our social strategy, I'd say, since I started. But you know there are times we stray you know farther away depending on how much NSX and vSAN we have to sell. But I really think that um, you know moving into the next year, you know, definitely want to focus more on the community and the people and some of the cool you know, home lab blogs and things that people are writing about. So right. you'll definitely see more of that in the next year. Yeah, it is interesting that they that, that tw Twitter noticed that with us, right? Yeah. That when they go to a lot of B2Bs and they, they come here, now maybe they're just playing to our strength, right? Because mm -hmm. they are a vendor that sells us advertising and, and <laughs> sure. you know, we have to spend money with them. So, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, even this podcast here, where if you look at the information that, that, that Eve has given us, right? It's it's perspective, right? Yeah. It's, it's just not a product sale, right? It's a, how are we doing this? And how are we going to build a data center uh, doing this? And I think a lot of the experts, that's what they bring to the table. They bring, yeah. and I tell people that uh, when, and I, I get, I kind of get looked at funny when I say this, but I go like, you know what? Everybody in this building, right? In Hilltop E, right? The whole marketing org is in Hilltop E and, and on the Palo Alto campus. And I go, nobody here knows anything about how to run a data center, mm -hmm. right? And <laughs> anything they write or anything they produce will be pretty much useless, right? Yeah. Um, from a standpoint of, you know, if I want to come and build out a data center and use our products, sure, over at engineering, they write good stuff, right? But the, the marketing guys, like, we do nice graphics, we do nice websites, and that stuff is needed, you know, when you mm -hmm. want to figure out what you're going to buy. But when you're operating the data center and you have to, you know, you know, run a data center and you have to talk to people that are actually doing it and, and build a plan and spend real dollars, you know, with headcount to be able to implement that, um, yeah, we're so far away from the data center, we're, we're a corporate, right? Right. 
none of the content we produce is going to be that that relevant, right? Right. Uh, yeah, and that's what the Twitter, yeah, I think is getting at, right? Was you know, being able to have a strong community program and then publish that, get that out into the user base, right? Is is good, and that's good for everybody. Right? Yeah, it, it really is, and you know, since VMware is such a complex technology to be able to understand, I really think. Um, our kind of position in social media is to educate um, people on how, how to use our pro uh, products. Um, you know, some stuff that performs really well is, you know, uh, how to get your certifications, how to run your own home lab, things like that. So I, I definitely think, you know, we're here to be able to educate people. I think that's one thing that we can do with our social program. And the second thing is just to bring people together, um, not only just on social media, but also to, you know, Meet, uh, join their local VMUG or come to VMworld and come right. and hang out with us. So I really think it's, you know, education um, and teaching people how to, you know, use our products, but then also, you know, bringing people together and the sharing of content. So maybe some people don't really know this, but uh, I know it, but I'll just, I'll lead, I'll, I'll throw you the softball over the plate and you can, you can swing at it, mm -hmm. which is what do you do daily to then uh, promote uh, what, what our ecosystem, uh, the experts are doing? What, yeah. what things can you do for them? Yeah, and it's really, um, you know, there's no secret ingredient here. I mean, honestly, a lot of it is just being plugged into social media. Um, I mean, you can find me on social media, you know, at Mr. Tommy Berry. I'm always online looking for, you know, good articles. I follow a lot of the V experts. And a lot of it's just making those relationships, you know, meeting people, seeing what are kind of the trends, what are the hot blog posts that people are writing about. Um, and then tagging me or tagging VMware. We will see you. We have a number of different tools. You know, TweetDeck is one of them that I have up and a number of different So, so if they tag you, will you like retweet them or how? How does that work? Yeah, so I mean, if you tag us, you know, not, obviously we're not going to go retweet crazy and retweet every single uh, thing because we get thousands of mentions every day. But we will see what, uh, if you're tagging us, we do see what you say. We will most likely respond to it, favorite it, and if it's great content that we think is relevant for the community, absolutely, we're going to give you a retweet. So, so you're, you're acting as a curator too. Yeah, ex right. I would say that's probably my 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 main job. And then amplifier. In, uh, yeah, in the case right. of really Absolutely. And then, program, and then yeah. you have you have team members uh, that uh, like for D Dynamic Signal, where sure. we have five thousand employees and the experts in that in that tool, and you'll harvest some of that content yeah. and then put that in in the Dynamic Signal tool, which goes out to you know four thousand employees mobiles, yeah. and then they can one click publish that it, content out into into yeah, their followers. That, yeah, that's a great point. Whenever we come across a good article, not only will we retweet it to you know the VMware corporate channels, but we'll also put on you know Facebook, LinkedIn. But we add it to, you know, our employee social media advocacy program. So putting in the hands of, you know, 5,000 employees so they can, you know, promote and amplify on their social channels yeah. as well. And I normally see like maybe 20, 30 reshares uh, when, when stuff goes into Dynamic Signal and gets pushed out to the employee base. Yeah. You know, that, that hits. You, you do nice images. You grab yeah. some images. You put it out there. And, and, and it goes far. And so I, I think that's important for people to, to know that if you do find a really good piece of content, right, I mean, I would just follow Eve, right? He's, he's got yeah, everything, course, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and just, just, just publish everything he's yeah. got. But if you do have stuff, you can actually tag Tommy Berry and, or, or Mr. Tommy Berry. Mr. Tommy M -R -T -O -M -M Berry. M-R-T-O-M-M-Y-B-E-R-R-Y. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you will, you know, maybe possibly put it out on the corporate channel. Absolutely. You have a, you have, we have like 50 or 60 other channels. And mm -hmm. then we also have the employee channel, right? Mm -hmm. That it goes out to a lot of different people. Yeah. So those are all things that uh, amplify, you know, everyone, you you know, and obviously we bring a few select on a podcast and we yep. talk about that as well. But uh, that's that's what you're going. And then Twitter's coming in going, yeah, do more of that. That is, that's, exactly. that's great. Yeah. yeah. Right? Do they want us to put... One of the things that I've never considered is should we be selecting some of this and then putting ad dollars on Eve's content, right? Like if mm -hmm. he does something that's good, we do do ad dollars that reach a larger audience than just our current followers. And one of the things I've looked at it for 2019 is maybe I allocate 10K a quarter or some dollar amount a quarter where we can grab some of this community content that we think is worthy and then put it out into a, a larger audience. And what, what I would talk about there is whether it's SaaS services, right, where we're trying to grow the, the vSphere on AWS marketplace, mm -hmm. right, where maybe they haven't heard of us yet, but here's a, a good 
good article that describes right. how it would work and how to do that. We could actually Twitter allows us to target non you know non people AWS people or because AWS has sixty thousand people at their conference, right? Yeah. We have twenty five thousand at our conference. Uh, by putting a s small amount of dollars, we could actually take community the expert content and push it out to AWS ecosystem, which is why we spent two hundred thousand to go to AWS reInvent was basically take the community message and the VMware code message and reach that 60,000 mm -hmm. member audience. And uh, one of the things that I've thought it would be interesting maybe is to take some dollar amount per year, 40K or whatever, and then grab some of that community content and then publish it out uh, into, into a larger ecosystem. Yeah, that, that's an interesting idea. You might want to do some studies ahead of time to see you know, the, the actual content that's actually reaching those people study study oh, yeah yeah, yeah. Just I, shotgun it out I lick there. my yeah. finger and I hold it and I feel, I feel it get colder on one side I'll, that's, I'll that's AB my, test it yeah, with my right. own content yeah right. I, I just think that you know foundationally it's just fascinating to hear that you know there's it's not just us that thinks that the power of community is like multiplicative right yeah you know like it's it, you know the power of us all together is you know almost exponential right mm -hmm. you, you think that you get two experts in a room and you get like two times the power no it's like you know it's a little bit more than that you know you you, you get some additional uh power just by having a group of people together right and and they they help each other and they help the community and and especially when it's coming from users and not from vmware as a corporate message they get you know a feeling that okay that's closer to the truth yeah right because it's an actual user exactly yeah and i mean even you know our branded channels are just a, a very small piece of our you know social strategy i mean it's really the community the v experts i mean everyone who's you know involved in social i mean that's really what our social strategy is we're just a small piece of that um you know and we can you know act to amplify the community goodness that's going on and to your point eric about putting dollars behind some of this. I mean, we already know organically that uh, the community content performs exponentially better than, you know, any of our branded stuff. So to be able to put, you know, some money behind that to introduce that content to some new audiences, you know, AWS audience, um, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I think there's only a handful of people out here that uh, has touched uh, 10,000 VMs and, and managed infrastructure that does that. And so, being able to harvest those people and getting them in and getting their messages out uh, is 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 good. And I don't think anybody in, in our buildings or have ever touched anywhere near that number mm -hmm. of VMs. Um, and so, I would almost say that maybe Eve is the only one that uh, has been <laughs> near <laughs> systems that have 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 hit volume. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if, I, if I look at our own test and dev infrastructure we we provision around 1500 to 2000 vms every weekend so um, right right, right. I, I'm, I'm pretty close to that but yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I think the only people that i get is maybe the, the hol guys come in here and yeah. and oh, you yeah. know they're running lots of vms because every time you do something it spins up and down a vm so uh, right. a little bit of different <laughs> counting there but and i think the, the when we when we look at the communities especially the expert community in contrast to some of the other it communities out there there is far more interaction going on in public mm -hmm. so um, when when I look uh, and I'm involved in some other um, IT communities as well where a lot of the in a lot of the Q&A and knowledge exchange is happening more in the back end in some closed slack channels mm -hmm. or something else whereas in the V expert round you see far more going on in public where you actually you post something on Twitter um, and I had that just two weeks ago where I had an issue with, with a specific HPE config and all of a sudden you have 20 people actually responding to it. Um, clearly that has something to do with your your amount of followers but you immediately get retweets. You mm -hmm. see really how this spreads in the community and you immediately get responses and that's what I what I always also tell tell customers. It's like even if you're not yourself that active on Twitter it can be quite a helpful tool mm -hmm. if you want to actually get answers to something and that cat could also be an interesting argument but i always tell to to enterprise customers is like if you look for 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 an expert or if you really look for some um some people um from a consulting perspective it might be worth not only looking at their certifications but also sometimes at um what they do on social media because that gives you a feeling on what's their level in the community because we need mm -hmm. to keep in mind that certifications are great but in reality, um, I mean, if I wouldn't do it for, for, for the business, if we consider that one VCAP exam is around $400, $500, I'm not even sure if that's, the, I think that's currently the current amounts, 
Um, if you want to have four of them, that's quite an investment. And companies mm -hmm. are getting more and more shy of actually paying that for their uh, um, for their employees. VCP you might get away with because that gives companies sometimes an advantage from a support perspective. But everything above that um, is is a different story. And only because someone doesn't have that certificate doesn't mean they are uh, lowerly right. qualified. And Communities can give you a good feeling on, on if someone is actually a good good fit for the job. Very true. Yep. You can see them an out there answering questions, right? And you go, oh, okay, well, that's the company for me, right? Mm -hmm. okay. They're out there helping yeah. people for free already. <laughs> they can All right. help me. Well, 2019 Tommy Berry, thank you for uh, doing that. And I'm looking forward to uh, more great real IT stories uh, on the VMware channel, as well as just promoting all of the experts that are pr producing great blogs and great content. So thanks for uh, shedding some light into what you do every day and what yeah. your team does. So I appreciate sure. it. And little plug here um, I am trying to get a little more technical on the social on with social media so I mean I did get my VCA over the the summer um, and then I even blogged about the the process um, medium.com backslash at mr. Tommy Barry so check it out all right there you go all right well we're at the we're at the top of our virtual hour here so <laughs> we've been running for uh, an hour so we're gonna close it up thanks for the guys on chat thanks for being here and a big shout out uh, to all the people that are listening and uh, pushing our numbers up every week we appreciate that uh, uh, Tony thanks for doing the snow thing and as also uh, Julia Klaus thanks a lot for doing live stream sorry we weren't on the Facebook uh, main VMTN community page but we'll get back there again pretty soon I think we're going to go live stream on YouTube we're shifting that as well uh, and we will again be here next week we got some good uh, uh, cloud services uh, guests lined up over the next two months I think we've got like eight eight sessions lined up already so it should be good uh, next few months and uh and again we're going to hit the com division candy box uh and <laughs> when we're, we're finished and uh and uh, last but not least uh tony i know you were out barbecuing in your backyard uh anything you want to share with regards to barbecuing out in the snow sure so barbecuing out in the snow two things um Make sure you keep your lid closed uh, so the snow doesn't uh, dampen your coals. <laughs> um, that, uh, it's important to remember that. A and remember that uh, food cools off quicker um, when it's cold out. So you don't pull uh, those chicken nuggets off the grill. They cool down fairly quick. <laughs> and then, and what did you think of the barbecued uh, artichokes? Were you guys able to eat them? I saw oh, that. Yeah. So we do, uh, it wasn't barbecued artich artichokes. Oh, no, no, uh, no. Sorry. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. Right. Right. Any yes, good? Yeah. I thought yours oh, missed. Yeah. A, I saw the video that you pushed on social, and I thought yours missed the boat because you put yours in a tin. You know, oh, you with, wanted with, the char. With, yeah, you got to have the char, dude. You got to you got to do it again. Oh, you're, you're missing the char. the char. I had the char, but but we will do it again. <laughs> I, say, do it again. I saw a tin full of very soggy looking Brussels sprouts. Uh, you know, I, I didn't see no nice crispy right charred Brussels sprouts. That's a slam. Wait. Your chicken looked good. No problem. Problem there, and and then the the yeah. thing, the tomato. What did you have with a with a hot sauce in it? You had it, something. They were uh, um, cinnamon apple. Cinnamon Ooh. apple. That, that Ooh. also Ooh. looked good, but I thought your Brussels sprouts yeah. looked kind of soggy. You know, right. like in a tin, well, right? Floating in liquid. We'll do another video with Brussels sprouts done your way. Yeah, yeah. Eric, on the on the grill, directly on the grill. Eric, did you say that we're on YouTube right now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we are going to YouTube. We are oh, not on okay. YouTube today because we had to wait 24 hours before they. But it's going to be on YouTube. Through. Yeah, we're pushing over so to YouTube. I think if you we were on YouTube, you like by contract you have to say, "Hey, YouTube viewers, don't forget to smash that like button." Yeah, and yeah. Subscribe. Follow us, like, subscribe, hit, hit the bell to get notifications. That's right. the first time that I've ever gotten to say that. I'm so excited. Yes, I'm very <laughs> excited. We are pushing this recording up on YouTube, so that will be worthy. Don't give us a follow because we need like a hundred follows on that channel to 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 be able to brand the URL correctly URL. and do some other stuff. And they won't let you do it unless you have a hundred followers. So if you're listening to this, you can go uh, smash we'll, that subscribe. We'll, yeah, button. we'll we'll publish the link out on social, and you can go give it a follow you, you have to say smash that yeah, that smash. subscribe button. It's, <laughs> I, it's the law i don't know why with that we are at the end of the show thanks to everybody and we will be back again next week doing what we do have a great rest of your day recording pod